Should we kick things off? Yeah. Awesome. So welcome. Um, for those of you just tuning in, um, I'm here with Dane Laughlin from Invista. Uh, my name is Lou Puschelberg. Um, so today's presentation is going to focus on uh, how to integrate VR into um, training processes. Uh, we're going to try to be really specific and share with you guys a case study of, of what we're doing, uh, how we're doing it, and, and why we're doing it um, in terms of building uh, some VR training inside of, uh, uh, inside of Invista. So uh, Luke kind of introduced me already. My name is Dane Laughlin. Uh, I'm an innovation engineer for Invista, which is the world's largest integrated fiber and resin intermediates chemical company. Uh, essentially, most of the products that you guys probably know from Invista uh, have to do with carpet, actually. So Stainmaster carpet, a lot of high wear materials. So Cordura is another one. Uh, we make a lot of like backpacks. Uh, also it turns into airbag fiber. So most of the cars that uh, any of us drive actually have a Vista airbag fiber as well, which is pretty interesting. Um, and so my job at Invista largely is going out into the markets and looking for uh, emerging technology that's coming uh, and then figuring out, you know, what that means for Invista as far as which parts of our process we can integrate those technologies into um, and then figuring out, you know, good use cases uh, where it makes sense to, you know, implement these technologies. Um, so we do this for about 10,000 uh, employees worldwide. Um, so, like I said, we're we're happy to answer questions. So, so please, you know, post in the Q and A. So, I uh, kind of went over this a little bit, but um, most of the the fibers that you see in carpets, so like I said, Stainmaster, some of the higher end uh, carpets like Antron, um, they all use nylon 66 for our, which is the kind of proprietary substance that we use, um, and uh, we also like uh, create you know airbag fiber that kind of thing. Um, we do a lot of intermediates. So um, and then also you know Coke as a whole, which is the mother company to Invista. Uh, they do uh, oil and gas. Uh, they own Georgia Pacific, so consumer paper products. Um, so there's a lot of different um, a lot of different fields that that we work in and kind of have access to. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. So hey guys, uh, my name is Luke Buschelberg. I'm the founder of a company called CircuitStream. Uh, CircuitStream focuses on education and development for virtual reality and augmented reality. Uh, we were established in 2015. Um, and this is actually the third company uh, in the XR space, which is kind of like a catch-all term for VR and AR um, that I've worked on. So previous to CircuitStream, I uh, was working on a social virtual reality startup that was based out of Seattle. Uh, and then we had a, a, a local uh, virtual reality and augmented reality education company um, before uh, founding and, and still building today uh, what is CircuitStream. So a bit of background on us. Um, like I said, we were established in 2015. Um, we're a team of experts uh, focused on VR and AR, um, and we're really proud to uh, have found some of the best uh, virtual reality and augmented reality designers and developers um, in the world who teach some of our courses. So CircuitStream runs a 10-week course that helps people learn how to make apps for VR and AR, and then also to help uh, develop some of the products and services uh, that we're working on in the training space, uh, which is what uh, Dane and I are going to talk about today. Um, so we also um, are kind of around the world teaching at events like this one at MIT today, uh, some of the world's kind of bigger VR and AR focused events. So things like EWTS and AWE, uh, it's a conference coming up um, uh, in California in May. Uh, so if you guys are interested in the VR and AR space and are looking for some great events to go to, I'd recommend checking out AWE at the end of this month. Um, so yeah, super, super excited uh, and happy to be here. Um, and uh, yeah, let's uh, let's kick off our presentation. Sounds good. So, so this is actually a video that is going to be similar to the process that we're looking to simulate at Invista. Um, essentially, uh, what and I'll kind of walk you guys through as as we're watching this process. You'll see three lines, and that's actually uh, molten fiber that's coming down through those lines. And the whole thing is their goal is to stretch the fiber. Um, around you know different spindles uh, and, and wrap it. So, so one thing that's really important to notice with this particular job um, is that it's very tactile, right? Uh, it it needs 
um, interaction with your hands, interaction with the vacuum gun. Um, so it's kind of a, a mix of, of how you interact with the actual asset, um, which is important to note because uh, that's, that's part of the reason why VR is a, a really good application for this particular technology or for this particular process. Um, so what he's doing is, uh, like I said, the strings coming down from the ceiling, uh, he's wrapping it around these different spindles. And then you'll see actually the, the three different segments that look very similar. Uh, that's each a different strand of, of fibers that are coming together to be um, kind of spooled up onto on a spool. So you can see uh, he actually has some fibers stuck to his hand here. But, um, you know, really the, the goal is to, uh, they, they call this the spinning process. So the spinning process is what we're duplicating. Um, as you can see, he's wrapping the, the yarn right now around uh, the different parts of the machine. Um, and, and I'll let this play through a little bit because I think it gives good background. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about, uh, about you know, why VR is a good application for this here in a second. But I'll let this play through I'm here for about another minute. So as you can see, he's wrapping it around. Uh, and then he'll have to feed it through a uh, little hole in the side and then wrap it again around the inside of this. Uh, I think that's a heat bin. So you'll see. So in a typical, like a plant, like how many of these machines um, would you have? Like, is it in the tens, hundreds? Yeah, yeah so uh, each one of these uh, is, is a different position is what they call it. So each one of the, the, the strands that's coming through the ceiling, you can see it's split into three different segments. Um, we have you know, several machines across a, a manufacturing floor uh, that have uh, kind of the same configuration. And so, you know, when people come in, we have to be able to train them um, on, on those particular, you know, machines uh, quickly because we want to make sure that we have, you know, optimized runtime possible. So this is the, the current state of Invista training. Um, so the, the problem that we've kind of diagnosed that we, we want to fix is that we have substantial training costs associated with bringing on new employees, right? So um, every time that we go to you know, train an employee, there's that, you guys saw that material coming down from the ceiling. We have that material um, that's being wasted. Uh, and then also it's on a physical asset. So you have to worry a lot about, you know, are people gonna hurt themselves? You know, this is a spinning machine. So there's entanglement uh, possibilities there. And you know, the number one priority for Invista and for Coke as a whole is to make sure that we're keeping our people safe um, and, and that we're compliant. So uh, this is a big thing for us uh, is the, the safety of employees. Another problem that we have is that the training ratio or trainer to trainee ratio is uh, two to one. So essentially what that means is that when we go to train somebody, uh, you have one trainee and then you have the peer trainer that's right there next to them walking them through the process. And then you also have the person, um, if you imagine two floors, one stacked on top of another, uh, there's a person on that second floor feeding material down to the first floor to train that person. So you have the, the cost of both the trainer that's there physically with them, and then also the person up top that's feeding the, the material down. And you can imagine, you know, we do, we do 120 to 240 uh, people as far as uh, doing training annually. And so, you know, that two to one ratio uh, is, is wasteful as far as using uh, the talents that we have and kind of redeploying that, uh, those talents to you know, high priority uh, events. And then, you know, I kind of talked about it a little bit, but the high cost of raw materials during training. So we have that, that waste flow through. Uh, as much as we can reduce that waste and then also increase uptime, um, obviously affects the bottom line uh, and makes, you know, makes for higher profitability. So the, the implications of the training um, is that we have opportunity costs for those senior operators, right? So the, the people that you choose to train your employees are generally going to be people who have a lot of experience in that particular area. And so because of that, there's a lot of opportunity costs in having a bunch of those people tied up uh, for training one person, right? So our goal is how can we get it to where we have one trainer that can train multiple people as opposed to having two people per one trainee. Um, and what we can do is we can actually take those people that are now kind of um, out of the training process and redeploy them to help kind of fix other uh, or you know, maintain uptime, you know, uh, tackle other problems that we have that are high priority. 
Um, so it's it's a redeployment of, of talent is what it comes down to. Um, so the implication for VR is that there's a 66 production, 66 percent reduction in possible training time uh, reallocated to operations. So what that means is that if we're able to take both of those people that traditionally train out of the picture, then uh, we can redeploy that 66 percent of the time that we spend for training people uh, to other tasks. Uh, and then for us, we had a million plus dollars of market value and wasted raw materials during the actual training process. So while training the 120 to 240 employees annually uh, cost us over a million dollars in, in material and flow through costs. So a lot of money there. And so the challenge is that um, it's not just, you, you can't just go and read about it, right? Um, you have to be able to actually go and, and feel the machine, you know, do the kind of get the muscle memory going. Uh, and so the tactile training uh, is, is a requirement for us and, and it's difficult given other technologies uh, that people are trying to use. Uh, we have a limited amount of trainers. So if we have to train you know, 120 to 240 people, uh, that means that we have to staff up on trainers, which pulls from other uh, projects that we have going on and other opportunities where we can create value. Um, and then you know, ultimately the goal is to increase the bottom line um, at, at the sites, as well as you know, maintaining uh, safety for our employees. So currently, kind of talked about it a little bit, but we have physical on asset training. So uh, if you think about the way that we do things now, uh, if somebody comes in new and they want to train on that spinning machine, they actually have to go physically to the asset uh, and want to take a moment too to talk about the environment of, of this training, right? So if we if we go by the, the traditional training method, um, the environment's really hot. Uh, you have to wear hearing protection, so you can't really hear that well. You know, there's there's all these different things that go into making that that training more difficult. And so our goal is, can we pull these these folks out of uh, actual manufacturing environment, put them in a quiet room where a, a trainer can have good uh, conversation with them. Uh, they can do it comfortably. You know, these types of things also improve the the overall training experience for employees, which transitions into you know, a bunch of other good things, you know, uh, I think just in general, people enjoying training as, is a really good thing uh, because it, it makes them get better faster at their particular job. So uh, what we'd like to do too is we'd like to replace the two trainer to one trainee and kind of go to more of a uh, one trainer to three trainees. Uh, so you can reduce um, the amount of people, like I said, uh, that are involved in that training process. Um, and then a big thing for us is that training currently is dependent on malfunction, right? So we have to wait for an asset to go down in order to bring somebody out there and do the training on it. Um, and so that's, you know, uh, kind of perverse incentives there because we don't want our assets to go down, but we want to be able to train our people. So we kind of have, a, uh, we have to fight that or find that balance of, you know, training people to having downtime. So kind of talking a little bit about the inefficiencies, uh, production costs, obviously, associated with this. Um, opportunity cost of labor, that's a big thing because if our people can go and be redeployed doing things that they enjoy and that they're really good at, um, ideally we'll get more value than they would, you know, in, in the traditional, you know, roles that we're having them do. Um, and then also uh, we have limited opportunities to train each day. So if, if we have a, a set amount of trainees and we don't have a whole bunch of downtime on the, the different assets, um, then you know our training uh, opportunities are limited. So uh, VR is perfect because it offers the ability to do you know unlimited training, um, and you know, you're not limited by uh, operational uptime. So our need was this digital off asset training, uh, one to one trainer to three trainees. And then on-demand training for all scenarios. So our goal is, you know, can we have it where uh, throughout the entire string up process, we can go and we can pinpoint different uh, scenarios that happen and then train people on those different scenarios without actually having to take them out into the field um, and do it on a, a, a real spinning asset. Um, so the implications of, our, of the correct solution, and I, and I think um, highlighting correct solution is, is a big thing because making sure that you quantify your use case is a big part of this. Uh, the last thing that we want to do is, is to do VR for VR's sake. Uh, we want to do VR for Invista's sake, right? So uh, making sure that you're quantifying that use case in a way that's productive um, and that we're not just 
you know, trying out technology just to try it. Um, no, definitely there's some experimentation <laughs> that goes on and things like that, but at least being able to uh, figure out what the core uh, capabilities that are needed is, is very important. Um, and then, you know, senior operators redeployed and then trainees get to mastery faster, increasing operational efficiency. Uh, so if we can make it to where people like doing training, then presumably they'll spend more time doing that. Um, and it'll allow us to kind of redeploy them at a faster rate. Um, and also, you know, like if you need to kind of re-up on your training or something like that, that makes it a little bit more fun. So Dane's talked a lot about the, the problem and there was you know, a lot of background kind of research and, and time and thoughtfulness that was put into really defining and quantifying um, the problem and the implications of that inside of Invista. Um, so the, the identified solution for virtual reality in this case um, was to create a, a simulation uh, that allowed for off equipment and multi-operator training, meaning somebody can go into a dedicated training room, put on a virtual reality headset, and there is the exact um, simulation of the string up equipment. Um, so they can now train unlimited number of times in the simulated environment in, in VR uh, and have say one dedicated trainer who's training four, five, six, even 10, 10 people, which is kind of the typical uh, cohort of, of, of training. So, Circuit Stream is helping um, Invista design the simulation, which is um, basically done. Uh, the workflow is, is starting from photo reference, so actually being uh, on site at, at the facility, uh, taking the appropriate uh, photos and videos, actually getting a feel uh, for the equipment so that when we go to develop the simulation uh, virtual environment, we understand kind of how that feels and can develop for so that new trainees can have the proper, proper muscle memory. So just getting a feel for it ourselves in terms of tension uh, and physics and kind of weight uh, so that we can as accurately as possible simulate those, those effects. Uh, and then obviously making sure that we're um, uh, designing all the kind of the 3D models uh, for the system uh, correctly and having that system flow uh, in a correct way. So um, we're using a game engine called Unity. Anyone familiar uh, in VR space or in the mobile or uh, kind of desktop app space uh, will have heard of Unity. Um, it's one of the kind of industry's leading 3D game engines. So it's used obviously in the gaming industry uh, as well as in uh, for training simulations in uh, aviation and aerospace um, in any type of AEC industry, so for architecture, engineering, construction, uh, any industry involving kind of 3D models um, or 3D assets, um, Unity is uh, kind of a primary tool and platform that's used in this scenario. So the simulation will be built inside of Unity um, and then deployed uh, onto, uh, we're using the Valve Index in this case, which is one of the newest VR headsets on the market. Um, and then we'll be using Circuit Stream's proprietary backend system for actually recording uh, the analytics um, and giving uh, Dane and his team at Invista uh, kind of a picture and some data of uh, who's taking the training, how long they're spending, where we're finding common errors, um, so that we can actually look at that data in aggregate uh, and then go back and make iterations to our training system so that it actually is improving over time based on uh, people's behavior and the value that they're they're driving from taking training inside of inside of VR. So that's that's the solution. Uh, again, we put a lot of thoughtfulness, and um, I think that was really part of uh, part of this process in designing uh, a solution that creates value um, into what the outcomes are. Um, so the kind of estimated outcomes that that, that we've uh, defined. Obviously, Dane talked about a little bit about this. Uh, but material savings, so just not having that actual physical raw material being used during training. We've obviously virtualized this process so someone can do as many string up procedures as they would like inside of VR, and there's no incremental cost to doing more um, training procedures. Um, and then the opportunity costs and just resource redeployment, um, so being able to um, have the best trainers on-site um, focus on 
being redeployed to working on assets and actually operational activities rather than um, training uh, new new employees at Invista. Do you want to elaborate on any of those outcomes? No. Well, I, I mean, so I think I think the redeployment thing is is really really important. Uh, I know I'm kind of harping on that a little bit, and I'll stop. <laughs> um, but it's it's really important because number one, it allows people to do things that they are passionate about, which empowers them to do it well, right? Because generally, the things that you do well are also what you're passionate about. Um, but it it also I think it transcends to a lot more value long term than even just the material cost savings that kind of thing. So I really wanted to kind of hit hard on that. Um, but I think you know I think that's going to be the core, and then obviously you have material savings as well. You want to talk a little bit about the technology itself? Sure. So like I mentioned, um, we're using the Valve uh, Index headset. Uh, there was a couple reasons uh, for using this this technology. Um, like I said, it will all be powered by Unity. Um, the two major considerations in this case was um, there in this process in particular, there's a high degree of dexterity that's required for someone to effectively learn how to operate this equipment. <coughs> Bless you. So you've got strings that you need to basically use uh, very small and precise tools to make sure that they're they're divided into the correct channels. Um, obviously, you have the the, the wand tool that you're, you'll be holding in virtual reality. Um, so we wanted to give people actually the full kind of dexterity of different fingers uh, for position precision. Um, so this new VR headset uh, called the Index, uh, you guys should check it out if you haven't heard of it. Actually uses sensors on the controllers um, and has some math they're running to calculate where what the position of your fingers are um, so that was the first thing and the other thing um, was just uh, kind of twofold uh, one this headset has a really high refresh rate uh, which basically means uh, it's really really precise so even if you move your head uh, you know millimeters it's the screen is refreshing fast enough um, that it will actually calibrate that movement visually so your eye perceives the correct uh, movement of your head, uh, something really, really important in VR from a technical side, um, and then just really, really good sensors. Uh, so again, you see those two lighthouse, um, lighthouse kind of those little boxes in the back. Uh, those are the sensors which allow the, the headset to kind of track its position in space. So it was really important for us because of the very kind of tactile and physical nature of training on the, the string up equipment that our tracking technology is really good. And that if someone puts their hand behind their back or they, you know, do a 360, that that's precise and that we've, we don't lose tracking on that system. So we'll be developing the, the, the system in Unity uh, from photo reference and basically going through a series of iterations with uh, Dane's team um, and the Invista team uh, to make sure that it's actually precise um, and that we're, we're, we're modeling the, the physical environment in a virtual scenario and then we're capturing that appropriately. Do you want to talk a little bit about the tiers of technology as far as you, know, you, you kind of have the consumer space where right. you have like your Oculus, you have uh, the, the Amazon, you know, or the Walmart $10 headsets you can buy. <laughs> and then you have, you know, the Valve Index at like the top end of that. You kind of want to talk about, sure. you know, the spectrum and what, what their use cases are. Yeah, that's a good, 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 uh, good, good topic. Um, so this, the spectrum of VR headsets that we kind of look at at CircuitStream today um, kind of goes from, you know, the very low end, distributable, portable, uh, very cheap, um, you know, headsets like a Google Cardboard. Um, and then that's obviously not, you know, a very high quality uh, experience. Um, and then if you look at like the core experiences around um, the Oculus, for example, uh, like Oculus clearly, clearly has kind of a, a strong direction towards um, being easy, being re cheaper, relatively cheap, um, uh, and being uh, basically fast to, to use and to put on and to get into an experience. Obviously, Oculus just announced a new VR headset called the Quest, which is the first wireless uh, VR headset. The trade-off um, for those uh, qualities is that the um, tracking and precision might not be as good. So while it's cheaper and, and it's faster and it's, there's less friction to you know, start experiencing VR, uh, maybe it's not as, as precise. So the far 
um, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum of that is what we're talking about, uh, you know, today and what you guys see on screen, uh, whereas the Valve Index is a little more expensive, um, but they've really optimized for uh, quality and precision, like we talked about with, with fingers and, and dexterity, and really high refresh rates and really high kind of precision tracking. So uh, the index is kind of at the, the top or, or the far right of the spectrum, um, kind of on a level of, uh, of, of quality. Um, so again, uh, it's a consideration depending on the use case. Uh, in our instance, this made a lot of sense just for the need to um, track track precisely uh, people's movement uh, and, and behavior. And, and for clarity too, there there are options where you can do finger tracking. So like Leap Motion uh, can be integrated with some of the the headsets that are already out on the market. Um, what we found though, the reason we went with the index is because you have a limited um, kind of view space within using Leap Motion, and so what we didn't want to have is you know, if I go out here, well now the Leap Motion can't read my hand movements, and so you drop off, right? And so um, we we went with the index because it gives you full dexterity in in 360. So I mean I could have my hand behind my back and be able to track my fingers um, as well. So that's that's kind of the the reason we went with the hardware that we did. Yeah. Uh, and then I guess one other piece of that spectrum would be like looking at, people are probably familiar familiar with HTC Vive. Um, so HTC has its own kind of perks in terms of enterprise technology, um, particularly in terms of uh, eye tracking, actually understanding where their users um, are looking. So that's just another kind of uh, major player in the VR space. It's kind of in the middle of that spectrum. Um, didn't want to leave out. <laughs> so, We've got a couple of key considerations um, that I think were uh, really learning points for us when, when uh, building this project uh, together. So um, we'll go through the list, and I just want to um, remind you guys that there's a Q&A, so if there's anything that we've talked about today or, or specific questions that you guys want to ask, throw them in that Q&A tab, uh, and Dane and I are going to address them at the end of uh, today's presentation. Um, but I want to go through a couple of these points because I think they're they're really important and you need to think through them when uh, I think before actually implementing any technology or writing any code. Um, so the first one that was you know a big uh, kind of discussion point for us was around intellectual property. Uh, so I'll let you kind of speak to why that's an important uh, thing that we think about. Yeah. So this this is actually uh, this was pretty interesting to me when we were going through this project because. Um, if you think about when, you, when you're going to build a VR project, um, you essentially, you're giving somebody the keys to your assets, right? You're saying, you know, go and design exactly what I have here, <laughs> and duplicate it, and then allow me to train on it. And so from an intellectual property perspective, it, it makes it kind of difficult because um, if you have uh, rights to the things that you're trying to replicate, um, it would be very easy for that to kind of be shared and, and misused. And so that was one of the things that, that you know, we talked about. So security and you know, cloud security specifically um, and encryption and all that, that fun stuff is, is part of that conversation. Um, but that was a, an interesting thing that I didn't expect before, before we started was um, you know, thinking through if, if we want to replicate this process, um, we're replicating exactly what we do. Uh, and so sharing that with folks um, might be sharing our intellectual property. So um, just kind of an interesting subset of the, the conversation that we had, uh, but I hadn't heard many people talk about you know, being able to integrate intellectual property into VR. Uh, so I wanted to kind of bring that up and talk through that with you guys. Cool. So uh, one of the, the key differences I think too uh, for our project as opposed to some of the other uh, VR projects that, that both we've done uh, within Coke and then also, um, you know, that we've seen on the market uh, is that generally now, now if you look at the VR uh, projects that are available, it's a lot of um, like environmental health and safety, for instance, is a, is a big one. Um, and they, they have uh, good outcomes as far as helping people learn, but they don't have any direct uh, performance indicators associated with it, right? So, um, like, for instance, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, if we do an environmental health and safety one and we put people through a simulation where they experience something that they may have never experienced before 
or like an emergency situation that could happen in the future that prepares them for that. But how do we quantify the value, right? So like, what's the value of putting somebody through a situation that they've never been through before? Um, and, and it's hard to tie that back directly to like a dollar value. Um, now, still, still important, still things we need to focus on. Um, but the, the cool thing about the, the project and kind of the use case that we found is that there's a direct correlation between how successful VR is and how much money is saved, right? So uh, we know that we have uh, so many hours per person saved, meaning you know, when we reduce the amount of trainers needed to train a trainee, we can count those hours, multiply it by the hourly rate. So you get your savings per person. And you just multiply that by the amount of people you train in a year. Um, and then additionally, you know, you can also take those hours and you can apply it to, so what, what is one of our assets being online worth to us per hour? So you multiply the hours that you have saved there as uptime um, into that equation. And so you can put together a pretty good, uh, a kind of a good idea of, of what the estimated savings are, uh, given that the, the technology can perform its, its task. So kind of an interesting thing. Uh, but, you know, Lou's kind of the expert on you know, training analytics. And I was going to kind of ask you to walk through some of the stuff that we've been talking about as far as, um, you know, what we're tracking, um, how we're doing that. For sure. Um, so, I mean, like Dane said, like the key point here is like, like tracking the right data. Um, in VR, like you can track a lot of data from like everything from where people's eyes are moving to like where they're positioning, like ergonomics, what they're interacting with. Uh, time score, um, et cetera. So, you know, for our, our case, like, like they mentioned, um, in this instance, um, the time uh, that people are spending training can be directly correlated actually to production time. Because if you think about, uh, you know, in this specific instance where training only happens when machines are, are down. So for every uh, hour, or, or minute that machines are down, and that has a direct dollar value. Um, so, you know, one of the kind of broad analytics that we'll be tracking is just training time inside of VR um, correlated to that dollar value of, of what that's worth. If you can have someone redeployed to get that asset up, up quicker, meanwhile, somewhere newer to the, to, to the training is actually just in the VR um, simulation. And, and to be clear too, we don't expect that it's gonna be 100% VR, like, um, you know, uh, a good friend of mine talks about how uh, if you read a book on swimming and then go try and swim, you could drown. Whereas if you <laughs> if you read a book about bird watching, you can you can go and misdiagnose birds, right? So um, or misidentify birds. So you know that's kind of the thing. And, and the way that we're looking at VR in a lot of cases is you know, what are really high priority, high risk uh, places where we can implement VR um, and you know have people. You know, so long term, it's probably going to be 80% VR, 20% on asset to get to full functionality and capability. Um, but that 80% is super valuable. Um, yeah. Um, so an another interesting consideration that uh, we've seen in the VR industry and in the training space specifically um, is that if you look at certain uh, applications, and I'm, I'm, uh, I, I think our use case will be very similar. Um, but if you were to look at, say, surgical training, there's been a lot of uh, studies and, and facts that um, a surgeon has to complete a certain number of surgeries, like we call it a thousand surgeries, um, before they've crossed this threshold where their rate of error drops significantly. And before they've completed that thousand surgeries, it, there's a higher probability that they would make uh, an error in a live surgery. So... Um, obviously, we're not doing surgery, um, <laughs> but it is a very kind of complex system that we're teaching people how to do that's prone to uh, injury and other types of economic risk. Um, so for us, there's also just this opportunity to get people to um, this threshold faster uh, because it's a controlled environment. We can control how many, uh, you know, the opportunities that someone has to train. And if the threshold is 1,000 or the threshold is 100, um, you know, we can we can measure and and count their training opportunities, uh, and then actually, you know, hopefully that they therefore the the rate of of, of injury or of error, uh, or just we can just decrease the speed that, that they can then actually go and, and operate in the physical environment. So that's some of the analytics uh, portion. 
Um, something I think that was also really key for us just going back and forth um, to this project was around making sure that we had a team uh, both at Invista uh, headquarters and on site and had the appropriate uh, resources allocated to take this project through from inception to completion. So yeah, why is that being important? So like, it's like for instance, uh, for VR, you need a, a good space that you can actually perform VR in and, and do you know, training and, and these kinds of things. And so a big thing for us was making sure that we have an area where we can dedicate and say, okay, we're gonna set up four pods where we're gonna do this training. Um, and then in addition, the, the nature of, of developing VR is that it's very iterative, right? So, you know, Lou's team goes and builds an initial thing, they send it to us, we give critiques, send it back, they, you know, take the critiques, build it, you know, so you kind of get this back and forth process. And that doesn't really work all that well if, if you don't have dedicated resources and people that are able to respond very quickly. Um, and so that, that, I think that was a key learning course is, and just in general is making sure that we have people dedicated uh, so that Lou you know, and, and his team can do what they do best. Um, another thing that's interesting about the allocation of resources is that, and this, this kind of goes into the implement, implementation of a technology, not just kind of throwing a technology at the wall and hoping that it sticks kind of stuff. Um, the reason that, that that's an important kind of uh, topic to talk about is because you can have a really good technology um, and a really good idea and poor execution will kill it for everybody, right? So like if you take something and you misapply, like you, you misapply a technology and it doesn't work very well, well, it's not really the technology's fault, it's the fact that the use case isn't that good. And so the problem with that though is that if you, if you try that, apply it, and it doesn't work the first time, then everybody associated with that project kind of has a bad taste in their mouth afterwards of the technology and it's not necessarily, again, it's not the technology's fault, it's the use case. So making sure that you understand the core competencies of that technology and then, you know, how do you pair that with, with a use case so that it, it's most effectively used? Um, hardware deployment on site. So we kind of talked a little bit about scaling. Uh, scaling is one of the hardest things, I think, just in general for, it, for any project that we work on in the innovation space. Um, and so we've talked a lot about, you know, how do we get this to multiple different sites afterwards? Um, how do you, you know, expand the, the training curriculum? Um, in a way that's meaningful and, and again, you know, making sure we're not just putting training in there because it's VR and people you know, think it's fun, like finding the use cases that actually work, um, you know, kind of a hardware deployment to the site. So making sure that we have the right IT resources that understand how to set up the computers and do all these different things. Um, so there's a lot that goes into the actual just, just straight deployment part of, of the project itself. Yeah, and I think the end result, just contextualizing that is, is literally like a dedicated training room with the four pods that, that Dane, Dane talked about. Um, and then also like a separate area, um, like on a TV screen, for example, where people can kind of crowd around and, and watch um, and almost, almost learn through osmosis. So if they're not directly in the headset, they're there with the trainer in a dedicated room. Um, obviously, you know, there needs to be proper computer equipment and hardware, as well as the headsets, uh, storage solutions. Um, so there's a whole kind of suite of um, things that have to happen in order to uh, deploy VR. So it's um, you know, not necessarily as simple as um, just rolling out some you know, more traditional desktop or laptop-based software. Um, there's really kind of a full process uh, from the analytics package and, and measuring and figuring out the uh, economic use cases to the deployment uh, and the follow through with resources on your team. Um, so again, these are just some of the things that we have thought through in, in putting this in place and, and building this project um, that hopefully you, know, you guys, if you're thinking about implementing uh, VR training in your own organization, uh, have some context around the going from, from A to Z or to Z. <laughs> So the last thing that we'll talk about is why VR versus AR, right? Because a lot of people say, well, why don't you just do the process in augmented reality? And the answer to that is, um, number one, we wanted to, ideally, the goal is to get uh, people who are training out of the actual manufacturing environment uh, for the sake of health and safety, as well as, uh, you know, like I said, it's hot, it's loud, you know, not the most comfortable environment to be in for long periods of time. Um, so VR really makes it easy because you can fully immerse uh, 
folks into that uh, kind of experience, um, as opposed to AR, you have to physically still be in that experience. Now, I think there is a key relationship there, though, because long term, there might be a transition where you do 80% of your training in VR, and then you do the last 20%, but equipped with a, a, a or I'm sorry, you do 80% VR, last 20%, you're equipped with an augmented reality headset, um, and it kind of walks you through the process very similar to what you saw in training. And so you kind of get, you know, if you think about like, you know, you, you have your, your VR and then you have your training wheels and then we take you out of your training <laughs> wheels and you can, um, you can do the job, you know, fully. So uh, I think that there is a progression there and, and we're, we're looking at, you know, potentials in the future. Uh, but for the, the initial kind of training case that we needed, uh, VR made a lot more sense. Cool. Yeah, and um, I mean the interesting kind of pr progression there uh, from the actual development of the technology is that I was saying earlier, all this technology would be built inside of Unity. Um, so when you know, if and when we're ready to make that transition from the assets from VR into AR, you have everything kind of on the same underlying uh, platform. So it's, it's actually relatively once you put in the initial uh, work to actually make that transition across um, across technologies. Anything else you want to add? No. Cool. I mean, I think we got some questions here, so I think we'll we'll go ahead and start answering those. Let me see if I can pull them up. All right. So we'll jump back up to the top. Um, we're going to do some Q&A now. So, uh, I mean, first off, thank you guys so much for attending. Hopefully, this session was, uh, was valuable. Um, and it looks like we've got a bunch of questions here. So uh, let's, let's dive in. Cool. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these to you, Lou. Sure. Uh, what kind of technology is used with VR and AR? Are you using HoloLens or something else, and what is the limitation? Yeah, so um, thanks for a good, good question, uh, Ahmed. Uh, in this case, we're, uh, we're using the Valve Index. Uh, we're building uh, in a, inside of Unity, like I mentioned. Uh, we're using a cross-platform um, tool set called OpenVR. So OpenVR lets you build for multiple devices, being the Vive, the Oculus, the Index, inside of Unity. Um, so that's the technology that we're using um, for, uh, for this use case. With, okay, with VR training and application design, what are other industries that serve besides production and manufacturing? Yeah, that's a good, <laughs> good question, Renee. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, like we've worked with people in the aviation industry. Um, so there's a company that will operate um, multiple airports around the world. Um, and any employee working airside, meaning on the runway and in that area by planes, um, has, there's a high degree of, of compliance and regulations that anyone who goes airside has to follow. Um, so because it's so systematic, um, we're working with this company who, who operates the, the, the staff uh, and this, the recruiting and the, the operations at airports to basically teach people how to perform certain procedures airside um, without actually performing them uh, in real life. Uh, because obviously if you're gonna go um, you know, perform something and you have to lease out a plane and you have to have a trainer and you have to you know, partition off part of the airport to go do training on, that's uh, expensive and, and risky. Um, so to be give you a specific example, um, there's certain kind of small to mid-sized airports where they may have um, multiple gates. Um, so let's say that there's a, a left gate and a right gate, uh, and it's someone's uh, responsibility. Um, airplanes actually have no reverse gear. They can only go forwards. So it's someone's responsibility um, to operate what's called a push cart, which is a vehicle which pushes the airplane back and it kind of operates with like um, like a trailer hinge almost. So when you turn left, it goes, <laughs> plane goes right, turn right, plane goes left. So um, in this particular use case in the aviation industry, uh, due to um, you know, a, a lack or, or inefficient uh, training, what would often happen is that this individual operating the, the push cart would take the plane from the left gate and push it from the left gate into the area it's kind of like an l shape so they push it along an l shape into the right area where uh, planes take off from so then what would happen is you have plans planes trying to land come in on the right landing uh, runway which is also the takeoff runway and go to the right gate 
because this, this person had pushed the plane from the, the left gate into the right landing area. Literally, you have planes that, that can't land. So obviously, <laughs> small like, problem, <laughs> small problem uh, operational uh, inefficiency. Um, so it's specific things like that. And obviously, the you know, string up application that we talked about. Um, um, and you have like Walmart, for instance, they went and they bought 16,000 headsets for Black Friday. And they're training people on how to manage <laughs> you know, the stress of Black Friday in VR. So, you know, th there's a there's a plethora of different applications and, and use cases uh, throughout the in industry. And I think largely it comes down to anything where somebody where you need somebody to experience something. That's that's the best use, use cases you can find for VR, because there's there's ways you can train on all different. Uh, things, but when experience is key, uh, that's where where VR kind of hits its stride and is the best application. Sure. So, did you build your apps in Unity from scratch, or which plugins and SD SDKs did you use? So yes, we are building the apps from scratch, um, and I mentioned uh, we're using OpenVR, uh, so that's the cross-platform uh, SDK for both Vive, Oculus, and Index, and that's the main one. Do you think that a wireless headset is a real need for training. I mean, I'll turn that one over to you. What do you think? Uh, I think it depends on the application. So, you know, for, for instance, for us, we actually probably aren't going to, like, we don't want headsets on folks because we want them to be able to have a conversation, ask questions, those kinds of things. Um, now, if you're trying to go for immersion, um, then yeah, probably. Because if it's, I mean, sound is, is a significant portion of how we sense things. Um, and so, you know, making sure that people are getting sound that represents what they're viewing um, is important. So I think it just depends on the, the application that you're using. But if you're going for full immersion, um, I would recommend a wireless headset or, or a headset in general. So geeking out on the technology a bit, <laughs> uh, you know, you mentioned that you necessarily don't want to have headsets on. Um, some of the newer headsets, they have uh, cameras built in and they have a mode that's called pass-through. Uh, so it basically allows the headset to turn on the cameras and to actually have the user see through the headset into what the camera's seeing in the real world. Um, so well, we haven't ex experimented with that yet, but it might be kind of a cool use case for us. Yeah. Want me so, to take this one? Yeah, go for it. So Arn is asking, um, <laughs> wondering about the precision required and the degree of similarity and realism using the index controllers. Haptic gloves seem like a more natural option, or is that too experimental at this point? So, um, I, I mean, I guess I'll kind of turn that over to you partially for the, the hardware portion of it. Uh, the thing that's cool about the Valve head, handsets is that they, they actually, the core of the controller is in the middle of your hand. And so when you, you grip something, it actually feels like you're grabbing a tangible object. It just happens to be a controller as opposed to whatever you're grabbing in VR. So you still kind of get that haptic feedback of like squeezing a controller. Um, or a lot of like the pinch grips that you see, if you think about when you're pinching something, you don't really feel that object all that much. You, you more feel the pressure of it. And so, you know, when you're, so for instance, for us, when you're pinching something using the index gloves, uh, the pressure of your finger on the other finger um, is kind of what gives you that, that similar haptic feedback. Now, if you have like a thick object or something, um, that might be a, a place where, you know, eventually uh, like resist. So they have like resistive gloves that they're working on where it'll actually like lock your hand when you get to a certain position uh, that would be the confirmation of that object. Um, and I imagine that, you know, for thicker objects, eventually that'll probably be the case. Uh, but for us, you know, with pinch grips and kind of where the technology is right now, um, I think that the, the valve index is probably the best application. So Dane, maybe we can, um, answer this one together. Uh, so Fernando is asking, can you elaborate more on the recording and analytics you use to measure and quantify each case? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the, the time is, is, I think, the, the key analytic that we're using because, you know, time is money. That's the, the cliche thing to say. But, um, you know, people's time also translates to efficiencies elsewhere. Um, so, you know, recording the amount of time of like reduced headcount that we need for training each person, you know, transitions into this is opportunity cost elsewhere. And, you know, uh, if you kind of work on the basis that that person is doing something more productive somewhere else instead of, you know, a standing feeding line or you know, something like that, then um, you can kind of extrapolate that that, that time uh, is, is money saved because they're doing something more valuable. Um, 
now as as far as uh like throughput and all that stuff uh again time kind of also turns into um it, it also kind of turns into you, you can multiply that by uh, the throughput of the site and that's kind of how you get your value there so a lot of our stuff is just making sure that it's time-based um, also you know we're looking at can we just in, record the entire amount of hours that are being used like the, the VR is being used and then that kind of directly correlates with time that would have been spent on asset um, so maybe like, like I said it's, it's a lot of time related and then you figure out what parts of the process um, that are maybe discrete kind of tie in with time and then you know, that's that's how you figure out your math. I, I don't know if that's a, a good answer, but that's... Um, I think elaborating um, on Dane's point, like as you can tell, there's no silver bullet, like this is the analytics, like this is what you're gonna record. Um, it's very much bespoke to the key metrics uh, of the business um, and then how you're correlating or bridging that to your metrics in VR. Um, for training specifically, I think another uh, interesting opportunity that, that the VR um, opens up is in the string up process specifically, there's a, a sequence of, of steps. Um, so I like, let's just use the number 12 as an example. So every time you have to teach someone, you have to take them through the sequence of 12, 12 steps. Uh, some steps are obviously harder than others. Um, and what VR will allow us to do is, let's say that a that, that, uh, user goes through that sequence of steps and for some reason, every, every training uh, sequence, they're missing step number seven. Um, and we, can, we could identify that in the analytics. User you know, just does, skips step seven or makes an error on step seven every time. Um, and because we can identify that, then we can go back and actually tweak or make changes to the training where we maybe, for example, like yesterday, we were talking with the analogy of like using a yellow highlighter and highlighting, you know, really specific component on step seven and just as a, as a cue for people to remember or to teach people. So being able to kind of measure and, and see how people progress through the series of steps and where they're, where they're making errors most often will actually let us, based on the analytics and the data, go back and make those tweaks to the changes so that over time, um, our training should actually be getting more effective uh, and better. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask <laughs> Lou this one. Uh, how does VR simulation design work? How long would it usually take to create a new simulation? What are some of the current challenges in creating accurate simulations? Um, in other words, how different is the simulation from reality and how does that impact training outcomes? It's a big, big question. <laughs> yeah, a lot of questions. Um, so VR simulation design works through a platform called Unity that I mentioned. Um, so if you're interested in this topic, I really encourage you just to uh, do a Google search for Unity 3D. Um, uh, they've got some great kind of tutorials and resources that you can get started in uh, so unity is essentially the platform where um, unity has two components you have 3d models uh, and assets or, or visually what you would see as a user and has a front end um, like user interface for uh, positioning and you know creating a, a scene and a scene is essentially the, the 3d environment that you're going to see it's got an interface for creating that and then it's also got um, an ide or a code editor that where you literally will will write uh, code and Unity uses uh, C Sharp, uh, and then inside of Unity, you'll attach the code to your 3D um, assets, and that's what actually makes them interactive, meaning that's what we'll make where, in our instance, you reach down to pick up the wand, you squeeze the grip, and you'll actually pick up that 3D asset inside of VR. Um, so Unity is kind of the connective tissue uh, for the code and the interactivity and the 3D assets. And then typically all those 3D assets and 3D models will be created outside of Unity in a separate 3D modeling program, something like uh, Maya or 3ds Max. So that's how VR and AR design works. Um, and then you literally have your headset plugged into your computer um, and you press play in Unity. And you can literally put your headset on and test the, test the app that you've designed inside of Unity. So as far as simulation goes, reality versus you know training, uh, how important is like hyper fine detail um, versus you know just kind of getting the general? Yeah, it's a good good question. Um, so uh, you know if you've 
if you're kind of familiar with the effects of, of VR and some of the academic studies show that um, it's not actually, uh, you know, your common sense is that it has to be really uh, hyper real, um, but it, it's kind of counterintuitive in that way and that VR, you know, effectively tricks your brain uh, well enough where it doesn't have to be photorealistic environment um, for you to get the, you know, the muscle memory and the motor skills of actually doing the process. So our process at CircuitStream building this application is uh, we actually start with a really kind of rough uh, fundamental uh, build, uh, something that we call a gray box, which is literally gray boxes. Um, and it's just a rough take uh, of, the, of the process of, of doing the string up. Uh, and then over time, we'll get more, more refined. Um, but to answer your question, it's, um, it's mainly an aesthetic thing. It's not actually extremely important that it looks uh, photoreal. So do you see AR being used in training situations as well? What kind of AR use cases do you see becoming more popular compared to VR? So we kind of talked about that a little bit. I think AR is a natural transition from VR in a lot of cases because you can take uh, somebody out of you know, a world that you completely control for them uh, and give them kind of a half and half experience where you're overlaying experiences on top of the real world and then eventually they can transition over to exclusively being real world applications or even, you know, using the, the AR for different functions. So uh, like attaching notes to, um, you know, parts where you want somebody else who comes by later to go and look at it and see that you've left them a note, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I think that there's plenty of applications where um, AR will be um, kind of the segue in, into the real world. Um, and then additionally, like remote assist, um, you know, the digital twin stuff, uh, being able to deconstruct something and have instructions right there in front of you. Um, all of those are going to be use cases where AR is going to be significantly better as, as a, like a manufacturing tool um, than VR. What was the name of the Microsoft uh, video for that specific application? Uh, yeah, so like Microsoft just came out with Dynamics uh, 365. Um, a lot of their tools, they now allow like guides, for instance, you can go um, and you can actually put like, it looks like a PowerPoint slide, but you can attach the different slides to uh, different parts on your model. And so you can actually have somebody who's brand new walk through a process, look at these slides and it'll point to the part that it's talking about. And then you can kind of deconstruct it and do work that way. Um, so that's a, that's a really good example of an awesome application for like a pseudo training slash um, having them at, in the actual uh, work environment where AR excel. So next question was, how do you track and evaluate performance during a VR training session? So I think um, like in, in, this, uh, in this specific scenario, um, like uh, Dane and his team have done their due diligence, in collecting the necessary data to say, this is how proficient, this is how long it takes a proficient person to go through the process. Um, and then this is how long it takes the average uh, new trainee uh, to go through the process. So like one of our you know, big metrics in terms of you know, evaluating the performance of a candidate is, can we bring somebody who is brand new from that level of you know, X number of minutes down to the level of proficiency? You know, in, in the delta between what we would save in somebody training and the level of proficiency, that uh, area in between there is the, uh, that's the value that we're saving as far as uh, time goes. So that's kind of how we looked at it is like you have core competency and then you have a new person and then you find the delta difference, and multiply those, those hours by uh, the value that you determine, uh, like your value drivers as far as hourly rate for uh, employees or uh, flow through rate for raw materials. And we had another question. Uh, and what other industries, you mentioned healthcare, do you see VR training becoming popular? Why do you think it's taken more time for VR training to reach industry? Um, so I think part of it is, I think the dexterity thing actually is a big part of it. So not having finger tracking, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I think also generally, uh, if you're trying to take something to market, it's probably easier first to go to a consumer because they're a little bit more forgiving. Uh, if you think about the way that um, the industry buys things, generally they have to have a pretty good economic driver in order to go and buy something. 
Whereas if I'm a consumer, I can just like something and go and spend my <laughs> money on it, right? So um, I think that there's a few different uh, kind of drivers there. Uh, and I, I think largely industry waits for the technology to get pretty mature before um, doing the application. And so I think largely that's probably what's been uh, the, the reason that it's a little bit slower in industry than it is in the consumer market. So next question is, what course of studies would you recommend a high school student who is interested to become a software engineer working in VR and AR field? I think uh, C sharp is definitely <laughs> something that I would learn. Um, I think coding in general, uh, the good thing about coding is that generally if you understand the structure of coding, um, then you can kind of go and find uh, the, I mean, you can you can plug in the same kind of concept to different languages, right? So just generally, it doesn't really matter what language you learn now. Language, certain languages are harder in, in the, um, the way that they're written and that kind of thing is more complex. But I, I think generally any coding class that you can take where you can kind of understand how the structures of, of uh, writing software works, that would be definitely helpful. Yeah, and adding to that, um, I mean, this is what we do on a daily basis. Uh, CircuitStream is actually helping uh, individuals uh, and train other companies uh, on learning how to create software for VR and AR. Um, obviously, uh, like we talked a lot about Unity today, um, so that's what I would recommend for you. Uh, Unity is actually free, uh, so you can go and download a free uh, license of Unity to get started. Uh, they've got some great resources. Uh, many of the folks on our team are now experts in the VR and AR field. Uh, they got started just by kind of playing and experimenting inside of Unity. Uh, many of them are self-taught. Um, so obviously, like computer science and coding are good, uh, good fields, but by no means uh, prerequis prerequisite to getting VR. Like we've worked with a lot of people who come from backgrounds as designers. I was or, say art, uh, art's a good thing artists. to study because. Um, if you think about all the assets that you use in augmented and virtual reality, it's all designed in, in and uh, drawn or you know created by somebody. So so art's a good thing um, as well if you want to be kind of on the, the visual side or you know the objects that people interact with. Yeah, so I, I think you know to, to that point, uh, really, there's no um, this may seem like you know too, too general advice, but there's no perfect perfect path. Um, really, like I would just say, get get in Unity, um, like. Get, get an Oculus Go headset um, for, for 200 bucks or, you know, get a, get a Quest or uh, get a Vive and just start building things that interest you because um, really kind of that portfolio and, um, you know, that's ultimately the best path <clears throat> is just to make things that you're interested in and then share them with people. So hopefully that helps. Okay. I think we're, we're taking our last question because we're going over time here. Um, you mentioned knowing... Knowing core competencies of a technology to get the most out of it, what do you think are VR and AR's core competencies uh, and where are they currently being misused? Mm. So I don't know I don't know that I have a good example of VR or AR being misused. Um, I just don't know that we, you know, it's a relatively new market, right? So I don't know that we have had the time as like an AR and VR community to really get deep into what these technologies could be. Um, it's kind of like the whole, you know, Steve Jobs didn't expect Uber when he made the iPhone kind of thing. So uh, we're, we're looking for, uh, we're looking for use cases. And I think that's the, the core of what kind of Lou and I are, are trying to figure out is, you know, we don't want to just do VR stuff, we want to find use cases where, you know, VR is the best option, right? Um, and so, like I said, I, I don't know that I have a good, maybe maybe Lou has a good example of, of a, a misuse of the technology, um, but I think I think the core competencies of, of AR and VR or, um, you know, obviously, like, <laughs> the, the most immediate thing is visual, so um, anything that it's hard to conceptualize without actually having like the physical object in front of you or being able to observe um, is really awesome. Um, you know, anything where you're trying to conceptualize something that you may not be able to see in real life. So there's a lot of marketing firms that are using VR right now uh, in interesting ways where, you know, maybe their product is so small that uh, you never use it. So like maybe it's a cleaning agent, right? 
Uh, and now they're using VR to be able to show you what that cleaning agent does, you know, at, at the honey, I shrunk the kids level on the table. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of kind of interesting use cases in, in that particular uh, realm. And, and so really, I think kind of mating visual and, and the need for, um, you know, direct like pointers, for instance. So I, I kind of talked about that Microsoft product. Um, you know, being able to point to a physical asset in space and say, this is exactly what I'm talking about, as opposed to like, you know, looking at a picture and then having to go and try and find exactly that, you know, uh, look at it from that position so that it looks similar to the photo. Um, those are all kind of uh, important parts, I think, that the AR and VR do, you know, that uh, kind of gives them the leg up, I guess, on other training techniques. And to add to that, like, this is, you know, the, that's what makes this industry like really fun and exciting. Uh, it's a growing industry. So uh, the exciting part is that we're still exploring and looking for those use cases. I think, I think we're out of time. Um, I think we're going to have our, our contact information stuff on there. So yeah, feel free to reach out to us if you guys have, um, you know, interest in, in VR. Uh, and then also, if you have unique use cases, uh, Lou is probably the better person to contact <laughs> because I'm just the guy that knows manufacturing. But um, uh, we really appreciated the opportunity to come and talk with you guys. And you know, like I said, our contact information will be attached. Thanks, everyone. Best of luck. <laughs> Thanks, guys.